Hey, and hello. Don't just stand there acting like a stranger. Come on in, have a seat. How about that last video, huh? Lots of love there. And I want to thank you all for that. I'm glad my ramblings could be of some help. Despite my insistence that I really don't know what I'm doing, for better or for worse, you've talked me into a follow-up. But listen now and believe me later. For a hobbyist, getting this close and personal is rather intimate. I've never let anyone peek under my cup before. Frankly, I'm a little shy. But I dug this hole and I plan to see it through. Not because I'm particularly good at this, super confident, or doing textbook welding. Far from it. This video, or these videos, are hopefully to help you get you out of your rut. Try something different. I hesitate to say it, but maybe even get better results. I assume if you're watching this, your TIG welding game ain't super. Mine isn't either. But if we don't help each other out, well, that's not the world I want to live in. So, seeing as we're here now, in that place I never thought I'd be, making a welding video, let alone a follow-up to a welding video, let's jump right into the deep end. This time, I'd like to talk about puddle control. Quick recap of last week's episode before we get started. First, hold the torch with your hand. Second, make sure you're comfortable. Now, I'm assuming you're welding at a bench. If you're under a car with your foot controller between your legs or at the top of a ladder screaming just a little more amps, then it's all on you. But if you're in the comfort of your own space, sitting down, well, get comfortable. Try to keep the torch motion as smooth as continuous as possible. Point the torch where you want the heat. Likely, you'll be welding flat, so that means almost vertical. Again, lean it back just a bit, enough so you can see what's going on, and try to keep a consistent arc length. I brushed over that in the last video, my bad, but keep as tight of an arc as you can without dipping the tungsten in the puddle. Maybe an eighth of an inch tops, three millimeters. You can't have too short of an arc, but it can certainly be too long. If the arc coming off of your electrode sounds like a hissing propane torch, it's probably too long. If you just can't resist that urge to dip into the weld puddle, well, you've contaminated your super hot incandescent tungsten tip. You're not stick welding with your TIG torch. At no point ever should the electrode touch the weld puddle or your filler rod. In fact, it shouldn't touch anything, ever. The right thing to do is to stop, regrind, start again. But if you're just learning, honestly, don't get carried away. I mean, after all, you're probably not practicing your TIG welding on the cooling system of a nuclear reactor. You're not, right? If the contamination is only a little bit, if it easily lights again and keeps a reasonable arc, you know, I mean, just keep going. I know I'm gonna get for that. You shouldn't do it. The tungsten will contaminate your weld and you'll have less control over the arc. But if you've got to stop every three minutes to regrind or change to a fresh electrode, you'll get frustrated and pretty fast. Frankly, and don't take this the wrong way, if you're dipping that often into the puddle, you've got bigger problems than a contaminated weld. I'd say just push through it, keep practicing, work on your form. Now don't misconstrue what I'm saying. If you've dipped your tungsten and picked up five pounds of base metal, you're gonna have to stop and deal with it. But at this point, form and sort of motor skill control really trump everything else. Now if looking at this big list of stuff is intimidating, don't sweat it, that goes away fast. Certainly if you've tried this and you've been having problems, just see if one of those resonates with you. If you're not doing one of those things, try to adjust for it. But as you practice, it'll become second nature. In fact, I neglected to mention arc length and not contaminating your electrode because that stuff, I don't know, you quickly take it for granted. It's like when I was teaching my kids to ride a bike. I started off with very clear charts and step-by-step -step instructions down to the finest detail, but they just wouldn't get it. It wasn't until I put them on bikes and shoved them down the hill that they figured it out. Now they automatically know not to fall on their face. And I didn't even have to get to slide 38 to teach them that. So let's have a closer look at weld puddles and puddle control. I'd like to start off with a staple of my channel, stating the obvious. I'm still working with the same piece of mild steel. I have moved down to a smaller cup size, number six, I think. Either that or a super high quality nine. That's not important now. I'm trying to manage how much light this weld is putting off so I can film it and still keep you seeing something. Didn't mean to freak anybody out though. We'll do the same thing we did last time, just run a bead. It's been a week easy since that last video, so I'm sure you've all gotten your torch angle and motion down pat. Let's concentrate just on the puddle this time. I'll strike an arc and give the heat a few seconds to melt the base metal, to create the weld puddle. If it takes too long or you blow a hole clean through your bench and into your nice Sunday welding pants, adjust your amp setting. Now given your settings and the gap you're holding, the puddle will only get so big. When it's maxed out, sort of stabilized, and I'm happy it's a good size for what I'm trying to do, I can start moving the torch. Now at this point, something magic has happened. 
we're working with a liquid, liquid metal. If I were to turn this piece over now, that puddle would just roll off into my lap. And again, the Sunday pants. Now, it wouldn't really do that, but bear with me, I'm being hyperbolic. As I move the torch, that puddle will follow along. It should stay right under the electrode, a little ahead of it actually, because of the torch angle, and in full sight, right where I can keep an eye on it. That sure is a nice spot for it, isn't it? As you move the torch, the arc is continuously melting metal in front, and the puddle is solidifying off of the back. Think of it like a rolling ball of awesome, picking up new material in front of it and losing some off the back. I'm sure you see the solidified ripples in the bead that the puddle is leaving behind. Anything I do to the molten weld puddle is telegraphed into the solid bead. If I just pull it along in a line, I'll get a little ripple pattern as that puddle kind of rolls its way along. If I made little circles, I'd get little circles. If I made little hearts, I'd get little hearts. If instead I move the puddle along in increments, say half puddle steps, maybe an eighth of an inch in this case, just like before, I'd see that in the weld bead. And this may start to look like the familiar fish scaling everybody likes to do. If instead I were to do, say, a figure eight, well, you might recognize that weave pattern too. Bottom line, how you handle the torch affects the puddle, which in turn becomes your weld bead. They're all one and the same. There is no spoon. Making funny shapes while you're moving your torch does have its place. Some joints are easier to weld with the fancy dance moves. But for now, for us, it's not important. As long as you follow those rules from before, do whatever you want with your torch. I recommend just long, smooth, linear moves at the get-go, but do whatever you want. If you're trying to get beads like the ones you see on Instagram, that's going to take a heck of a lot of practice. It's like handwriting. Naturally, everyone's sort of got their own style. You can improve your handwriting, change your style, but it takes practice. But for now, the idea here is to get a feel for how your torch motion allows you to control what the puddle is doing. And of course, what the puddle will look like. Welds don't have to be pretty to be strong. An ugly weld doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad weld, like mechanically. On the flip side, a gorgeous weld doesn't necessarily mean it's a strong weld. Now, usually that's not as much the case with TIG as opposed to other welding processes. In my experience, stick and MIG can hide a poor mechanical joint. It's harder to do that with TIG. It's certainly possible, it's just a little harder. That's probably a discussion for another time. Now let's see what happens with too long of an arc or too much torch angle. The end effect is similar. Here I'll pull the arc to two, maybe three times longer than it should be. Now, at first glance, other than the porosity I'm picking up because of poor gas coverage from being so far away, there doesn't appear to be too much difference in the weld puddle itself, right? I mean, it's still there, it's round, it's a bit smaller, but more or less behaving. Have a closer look, though at where it is with respect to the torch. See how with this large arc length, it's sort of lagging? It's almost directly under the electrode instead of leading it. Because of that, we've lost control. To explain why we've lost control, I have to jump ahead a few chapters. We'll get deeper a little later, but for now, there's two things you really should know. First, you can't really weld without filler rod. I mean, in some instances you can, but nine times out of 10, you need to feed your puddle more material. A starved weld puddle, like the ones we've been making, will usually break. Not to mention filler wire probably has lots of alloying elements, antioxidants, vitamins, minerals, everything a growing weld puddle needs. Second, and this one's a little trickier, the weld puddle itself should melt your filler material, not the arc from your TIG torch. Think of it like soldering or soldering, sweating pipe. You really want the hot copper pipe to melt your solder, not the flame from the torch. The flame will melt your solder, but it probably won't bond to your pipe. It's not exactly the same in TIG welding, but close. The analogy hopefully should do. The puddle melts your filler rod. Let's go back to the long arc. If you try to add filler rod to this, it'd never make it to the weld puddle. The rod would melt as soon as it enters the arc cone, and it would just drip down onto your puddle instead of into it. Splish splashing around, cooling it down, turning it into funny shapes. And not the good kind of funny, mind you. We can't control this weld because we can't control where we're depositing filler material and how it's settling in. Now, sure, you could just jam it in there. It would melt, but it wouldn't really end up looking so great. But you already knew that, didn't you? 
And while we're here, wow, just look at that porosity. This would want more gas. Well, technically it wants a shorter arc, but as is, the back of the puddle is still too hot when it gets out from under the torch and is now exposed to the atmosphere. It's no longer being shielded. Or due to the large gap, my argon flow is pulling air into the molten puddle. This can also happen, by the way, if you have a leak in your line anywhere from your regulator to the torch itself. If it draws in air, it'll dump it into your molten weld puddle, resulting in this sort of porosity. So everything we've done so far between these two videos comes down to puddle control. All that jazz about short arc length, smooth, consistent movements, torch angle, it all comes down to puddle control. And frankly, all of this goes for any welding process. Certainly there's a lot more to welding. Prep, joint design and penetration, metallurgy, temperature control, distortion, post-treatment if there is any. The list is long. But mechanically speaking, like academically, as far as going through the motions, hopefully this is a good start. From here on out, it's still about, say it with me now, puddle control. T-joints, vertical or overhead welds, uphill or downhill, round and funny out of position welds, all while adding filler, of course. The next step usually involves moving to multiple pieces, actually gluing two things together. Probably fusion welding, meaning controlling the heat and weld puddle to fuse two pieces together without the help of filler material. You might start off with two flat pieces side by side with no gap and have to fuse those. This is called a butt joint, by the way. They call it that because it looks like your butt, kind of with the... Then you'd likely move to a lap joint. Here you'd likely do the same thing, fusion welding it at first and then moving to filler. But soon you'd move to T-joints. T, of course, stands for Tony. Or joints with large gaps. In both of those, you'll start to see more harder challenges controlling the weld puddle. The puddle might start to act more like a spoiled two-year-old than the nice puddles we've been seeing so far. Maybe in a T-joint, you'll have trouble getting the puddle down into the corner. Heck, you might even have two puddles, one in the vertical piece and one in the horizontal, and they just don't want to come together without massive undercuts. Or in a gapped joint, you strike an arc and suddenly your Moses is opening the parts up like the Red Sea. Not to mention joints getting all cheeky and vertical. There, not only are you now toe-to-toe -to -toe with gravity, you'll also need to develop lightning-fast coping skills to get molten metal out of your ear, out of your shoe. Anyway, I'm starting to get loopy. I need a nap, and this video is getting long. If you like how these videos are going though, if you think you're getting something out of it, let me know down in the comments and maybe we'll tackle one more. As always, thanks for watching.